My sister is doing My parents are both pitching and moaning. She's making them get a flu shot. <laughs> they don't want to get a flu shot. And the like, professional. And the like, she's a nurse. 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 She's Next time, just put a bit of camera on the floor. I mean, I don't think that. So, I just don't understand what I was like. It's fine. Demand this flower paper. Yeah. 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 Yeah
What time did you one person like, tried to cut them in half and, and then brought them in like, but to like, crack them I mean, some people clearly I just can't let me talk to each Okay, everybody. Um, <laughs> today, this is the, um, the, I think the third public seminar from the uh, Partnerships in, in the Educational Research Program. Today, we have Robin Jacob visiting from the University of Michigan. Robin uh, finished her PhD in, um, in public policy from the University of Chicago and has been on the faculty at University of Michigan since 2006, where she has a joint appointment between the Ed School and the Institute for Social Research um, there. One of, so since, since completing her, her PhD, Robin has been focused on measuring education reform from the classroom level uh, perspective. So one of the early projects she worked on was evaluating the reading first intervention. Today, she'll be talking about um, a study of math instruction in kindergarten classrooms in New York City. And the, the thing that is really striking, I think, um, as I was reading the paper, is just the degree to which the research in education is driven by the economics of data collection, honestly. It's, it's, it's not that what happens in the classroom is inherently less interesting, um, or that uh, people that, you know, psychological theory and other theories have less to say about what might be happening in the classroom. The reason why we don't see as much research um, like the research that, that uh, Robin does is, is simply the cost of, of data collection, the cost in terms of time. Uh, to, to do the classroom observations, to do the training, to do the data collection. So like, one of the things I'm going to be uh, thinking about, and I hope we all think about, is like, what, are there things that we could do? Are there things that would like help change the economics of, of change the costs of doing that kind of data collection work? If we were to do a broader set of data collection, could we then make that available to more researchers, or, or is there a different approach to trying to expand research in, in that um, area? So in any case, um, uh, we're lucky to have Robin here today to talk about this, this study in New York City and, um, and what we've learned about math instruction um, in kindergarten and New York City. Great. Thank you so much, Tom, and thank you for inviting me to come. It's wonderful to be here. There are a lot of familiar faces in the audience. It's really nice to see old friends and to meet some of the new fellows. I really enjoyed my lunch with everyone today, um, and we'll look forward to talking with people some more afterwards. Um, today, I'm going to be presenting on a small start small part of a much larger study that is taking place in New York City. Um, this particular part of the project is focused on understanding what classroom instruction looks like in mathematics in kindergarten. Um, and it is joint with my colleagues Mimi Engel, who's at Vanderbilt University, Amy Claysons, who's at the University of Chicago, and then a variety of staff at MDRC. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit uh, and would also welcome questions about the larger project that this is all a part of. <coughs> And also, I'll also say, please feel free to interrupt me if you have questions. I'm happy to take questions as I go. Um, support for this particular part of this project was provided by the Heising Simons Foundation. Um, the primary data collection was done as part of a collaboration with folks at MDRC, and that much of the data was actually collected by staff at MDRC. And I want to take a moment just to acknowledge Doug Clements and Julie Sarama, who developed ECOMET, which is the part of the observation tool that we used as part of this, and also Dale Farron and Carol Bilbrey, who developed the original narrative record, which was also used as a part of our data collection. So I'm going to 
talk a little bit first about the motivation for this talk. Uh, I'll go over some of the prior research uh, that's been done on kindergarten uh, instruction, outline the research questions, talk about the data and methods, and then we'll talk about results and I hope that it will spark some discussion. This is a very early draft of this paper. We collected this data during the 2015-2016 school year, so this is kind of our first cut at this and are still thinking about what the implications of what we found are, and so we really welcome feedback from all of you about where else to go with this. Um, just as a, a note, I did not put references in any of my slides in the interest of having more white space and less fewer words, but they are all in the paper, uh, and I will try to acknowledge people as, as we go. So why are we studying kindergarten mathematics? I, the first reason we're studying is because early skills have consistently shown to be uh, early predictors of later school life and, uh, and school and other life outcomes. Uh, there is a whole body of research, both in economics and in psychology, showing the correlation between foundational skills and later life outcomes. Um, there's also uh, you know, research out that shows, uh, and Heckman argues pretty convincingly, that early may be the best time to invest. The longer you go, the larger the uh, skills gap get, and uh, we would probably do better from an economic investment standpoint to invest as early as possible to try to ameliorate those problems. And you know, it's very clear that by the time kids get to school, there are already gaps that exist based on background and, um, and socioeconomic status. So we'd like to get in and intervene as early as possible. So why math? Um, so a, a bunch of research that's come out in the last 10 years or so has shown consistently also that early math skills are more predictive of later life and school outcomes than either reading or social emotional skills. And you know, work by Greg Duncan shows that early math skills are uh, more predictive of later reading skills than even early reading skills. So it seems like math is an important component. It is all correlational, it's an association, we don't know for sure that it's causal, but it seems to suggest that there's something important about how uh, children learn and the math skills for predicting uh, later outcomes. Yeah? Okay. Robin, uh, that seems right, but uh, it seems like that's out of step with like the prevailing conventional wisdom in the policy space, which is really focused on early reading and you know, get everyone to read by grade three. Do you have any speculations as to why that might be the case? I, you know, I think, I don't know for sure. I think you're absolutely right. Uh, we invest way more money in early literacy than in early math. You know, the Reading First study that I worked on, it was six billion dollars to support early reading. I suspect it's also often just motivated by these claims about the predictive power of early reading skills, and you're saying that you could make a stronger argument here. Um, I, yes, I think that early reading is clearly predictive of later outcomes, and it's only when it's only been in the last 10 years when people start to look at them all together to say, well, what are the skills that are that are most predictive? I would also say that there's something very intuitively appealing about. Uh, thinking that reading skills are important, right? If you can't read, you clearly are not going to be able to do history, and um, you're not you're going to have trouble reading the math problems. Nobody looks like I think the only other thing I'd say is <clears throat> it's sort of vocabulary that sits between the two, right? And so it's sort of a conceptual reasoning. I think that the early math measurement is picking up that the later comprehension measures are picking Absolutely. up in reading. Yeah. But is the campaign for early conceptual reasoning not not the point so <laughs> neatly back, right? But Absolutely. I think if I think that if the ECLS K had done a better job with the reading measurement as as not just rote reading skills, it might be a slightly different conversation. Not that I have any yeah. any stake in either one, but there's it's something about the conceptual reasoning. And this overlap between yeah. the two, really, right. if you look at some of the language and math studies. Absolutely, and I think Doug Clements argues that a lot. That's that right. But the, the, what, the, what he does in his uh, early math right. intervention is to develop kids' capacity to speak and talk yeah. about the math that they're learning yeah. and develop that vocabulary and that reasoning. Um, I think Imagine a metacognitive policy. Imagine a policy on <laughs> metacognitive. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly not right now. <laughs> Probably not. Um, so how might we promote early math? Um, we could spend more time on early math. 
We could present children with more challenging content. We could deliver math in a more high quality way. We could uh, ensure that teachers have the appropriate, appropriate mathematical knowledge to, to teach math. And one of the things that uh, has come out in recent years is that content exposure does appear to be one key to, uh, to one way that we can influence early math skills. So Amy Claysons and Amy Engel, my colleagues, have done work with the ECLSK where they uh, look at what children know when they come into kindergarten and what teachers are spending time uh, on in those kindergarten classrooms. And so what they find, and this has been also, I think, documented by Doug Clements and Julie Saroma as well, is that a vast majority, 95% of all kids come into kindergarten knowing their basic shapes and being able to identify the numerals 1 through 10 and count to 10. And that uh, almost, and those, there are approximately 5% five five of the students who uh, don't know those skills. They do benefit when they're taught those things. But um, teachers spend the most time in their kindergarten classroom uh, having children identify basic shapes, identify numerals, and count from 1 to 10. And what Mimi and uh, Amy's research shows is that all students, uh, even the ones who come in not knowing basic shapes and numbers, uh, benefit from exposure to more advanced content. And by advanced content, we mean like early addition and subtraction, which almost no kindergartners come in knowing. Um, and in general, students who are exposed to more advanced content do better in both reading and math, and their findings hold for children from low-income families as well as from upper-income families, and regardless of their educational experiences prior to kindergarten entry. Um, and it's been pretty robust, and they've demonstrated it with uh, both waves of the ECLSK, uh, and it's gotten a lot, a lot of attention in recent years. Yes? So, the question then follows, then why aren't teachers doing it, right? Like, exactly. Is it because of the textbooks are not that way? The worksheets aren't there? Right. So, um, um, <coughs> yes. so this is this is how we got to this research exactly, because Mimi and Amy have been going around presenting this research, and that's the first question that people always ask. They say, well, okay, but why, why is this the case? Um, and so Mimi and I were actually talking about this, and I said, you know what? I, we're going to be collecting data in kindergarten classrooms in New York City. It would be great to actually go in and observe what's going on and talk to teachers and find out why they teach what they do. Um, so there's some other limitations to the research as well. So one, you know, the ECLSK asks very broad questions about what instructional content is being covered. And so we don't know at all at a granular level what uh, content is actually being covered. Um, you know, counting can be done in a lot of different ways, some that build more advanced skills and some that are just simple row counting, like you're saying, the ABCs. Um, there's no insight into why teachers are teaching this content. It could be because uh, that's what the curriculum says. It could be because nobody ever tells teachers, like they don't assess kids that are coming kindergarten and say that they don't know. It could be because teachers themselves feel uncomfortable with teaching more advanced concept. And Mimi has a, an argument too that there's a nice feedback loop. It feels really good to teach kids something that they already know and you, so that they, they are able to be successful and they provide positive feedback to the teacher and it feels good and so it feels like a good place to be. Um, there's also no information in the ECLSK about how the content is delivered. Uh, you know, again, the content can be delivered in a way that really helps build deep conceptual understanding that's going to build on future things, or it can be delivered in a very broad fashion. We don't know really that much about how that gets delivered. Um, all the data is, of course, based on self-report, which it's asking teachers at the end of the year to remember what they did over the course of an entire year, and so there's some unreliability there, and it could, it could be off. And then finally, most of the ECLSK data was uh, gathered before Common Core state standards were adopted. And so one of the things we were curious about is whether any of this has changed as a result of Common Core. So the things that we set out to answer are the following. Uh, one, we just want to know how much time kindergarten teachers spend on math instruction, both formal and informal. So formal during like their math block and informal throughout the day, whether they're uh, teaching math as part of their science or social studies or things like that. What specific and more detailed content is covered, exactly how that math instruction is delivered, and then how do those findings compare to the Common Core State Standards, to district curricular materials, and to what we already know about math instruction from prior research. So um, 
I think I mentioned the study takes place in New York City. Uh, the data was collected in 24 New York City public schools that were selected because they were part of a larger project that is being funded by the Robin Hood Foundation. So the Making Pre-K Count study is the first part of the Robin, Robin Hood Early Childhood Research Initiative, which is a partnership between Robin Hood and MDRC. And the goal of the partnership is to think about ways to increase the life outcomes of uh, children living in poverty in New York City. Um, and uh, so the Making Pre-K Count uh, study is designed to understand whether strengthening math instruction in the early grades can lead to short and longer term learning gains. And it was a random assignment study of preschools in New York City. Uh, and the preschools were randomly assigned to implement the building blocks program. Uh, there was a second component to the study as well where we um, implemented a, um, a math club model uh, in these same 24 schools because lots of the research on early childhood shows that there's a nice impact at the end of pre-K and then it quickly fades out over time. And so an effort to um, uh, try to shore up the math skills uh, for two years in a row instead of just one. Anyway, so these schools were a part of that study. Um, the were these from treatment or control? Uh, these are these are treatment schools, but and it but is a mixture of children who did and did not have building blocks in pre-K, children who did and did not have the math club model in kindergarten. So, but it, they were treatment schools. So the schools are located in four of the five New York City boroughs. There were no schools that were in Staten Island. 93% of the students were living in poverty, uh, uh, mostly a minority sample of children, and 14% of the children in these classrooms were English language learners. And so we conducted uh, observations of kindergarten classrooms last year during the 2015-2016 school year. Uh, we trained faculty, graduate students, staff, including staff from MDRC, um, and some postdocs to go out and conduct the observations. There are about 10 of us that conducted the observations over the course of the school year. Teachers were randomly ordered within schools, so we got a roster of all the kindergarten teachers, we randomly ordered them, uh, and then we uh, went to the schools and tried to obtain consent from the teachers in the order that they were listed. Um, and uh, we had fairly high consent rates in the fall, only seven teachers declined to participate. Uh, in the spring we only had one teacher that declined to participate. And talk a little bit why, about why that was, um, but uh, I think we did not anticipate the resistance that we were going to get from the teachers uh, in the fall, but then once we had been in one time and done it, they were much, uh, they felt much calmer about us being in their classrooms. Uh, we did exclude special education inclusion classrooms, mostly because the schools were uncomfortable with us observing in those classrooms, and we also excluded classrooms that were taught entirely in another language. There were ELL classrooms that taught, you know, Tuesday and Thursday in Spanish and Monday, Wednesday, Friday in English. We did observe in those classrooms, but if it was entirely in another language, we did not observe. Um, so in the fall, we were in 15 classrooms that we observed for the entire day. Uh, we did that because we wanted to understand how much reading versus math was uh, content was being, and understand what other things kids were being exposed to, and also so that we could capture any math that did not happen inside the math block. We were in 21 classrooms that were just observed for the math block. So we had a total of 36 classrooms we observed in the fall, which represented about 45% of all the kindergarten classrooms across those 24 schools. And then in the spring, uh, we had 39 classrooms that we observed in, which was about 55% of all those kindergarten classrooms. And there were six teachers in those classrooms that had not previously been observed in, in the fall. So we had six new teachers as part of that sample. Um, and today, I'm going to be just showing the data from the 15 uh, classrooms for the full day. We're still processing the math block observation data, but I will tell you that you know all the preliminary results look very similar. So. You know, the basic findings here are um, confirmed with the full sample. Are they the same 15 classrooms? So in the fall and the spring? Yeah. So the for the full day. Uh, they're mostly the same classrooms. Uh, so there were uh, we added an additional three teachers uh, in the spring new, who were new of the total 39, and then we had three that were um, that declined to participate or that were not available in the spring, like they were on maternity leave or, or some other thing. So for the most part, it was the same. Um, we observed at two points in time because we wanted to, you know, capture how instruction changed over the course of the year. Um, uh, and, yeah, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, uh, why we observed what we did and, and what that means in a minute. Any other questions about the sample before I talk about the 
the... So we used two different observation tools when we were in the classroom. The first is the narrative record, which I already mentioned, was developed by Farron and Bill Bray. It is designed to capture everything that goes on in a classroom over the course of the day. It captures the content that was being covered, you know, was it math or literacy or social studies or gross motor skills. It captures instructional grouping, so was it was a class uh, in a whole group setting? Were they doing seat work? Uh, were they in a transition of some sort um, for each segment of instruction? And then uh, each time uh, the either the content changed or the grouping changed, uh, you wrote a brief description of what the teachers and students were doing in their classroom. So we get a pretty clear picture of what the class day looks like. Then we also used the kindergarten classroom observation of early mathematics environment and teaching, the K Comet, which was originally developed by Clemens and Sarama for use in pre-kindergarten classrooms. We shortened it slightly and also added um, the appropriate content for uh, observing in kindergarten. And the Comet captures detailed information about what are called specific math activities. So a specific math activity is any math activity that lasts over a minute where uh, mathematical knowledge is being imparted to children. And a new math activity, or SMA, gets recorded every time the materials that are being used change. So if they are using worksheets and now they start using building blocks. Anytime the content that's being covered changed, so the teacher says, okay, now we're going to finish our counting and we're going to start doing addition and subtraction. Or um, anytime the, the instructional grouping changed. So if the teacher was teaching in a whole group setting and she says, okay, now everyone go back to your seat and we're going to take out our workbooks. Um, that uh, constituted a new SMA. And then for each SMA, uh, we recorded the specific math content that was covered whether teachers were actively involved in the teaching, whether students were actively involved in the math. We recorded the materials that were being used, the grouping that they were in. And then we had a bunch of um, questions about how that instruction was being delivered. Was it clear? Uh, was the observer and the student, were, the, were they, was it clear what the teacher was trying to deliver? Were there any mathematical errors? How many open-ended questions uh, were asked? whether the teacher engaged children in types of mathematical reflection, and then some information about scaffolding and differentiation. Just quickly, that's, these are all the math practices. I know you can't see that. Um, so, uh, so we were only in the classroom at two points in time. We were one, there once in the fall and once in the spring, and we really wanted to understand what was the full range of content that kids were getting exposed to, and so, um, Almost all of the classrooms uh, that we were in were using the same uh, curriculum, uh, and it was a common core state standard aligned curriculum. And so we coded that curriculum, and we coded it um, using basically the outline of the COMED. Uh, we did not, you know, capture student engagement because you can't code that in the curriculum, and we didn't uh, look at the clarity of instruction, but we looked at the content that was covered, the materials that were suggested, the grouping that was suggested open-ended questions, mathematical reflection, and scaffolding in that so that we could look at um, uh, what the curriculum was instructing teachers to do. Robin, was this the same curriculum that other classroom, other kindergarten classrooms in New York City were using? Or was this unique to the schools that had used this other correct building blocks curriculum than pre K. Yeah, great question. So uh, it was uh, what most of the kindergarten classrooms in New York City were using. Um, not everyone used this curriculum, but 95% of the schools in our sample were using it, and uh, that was consistent with what was being used across the state. So just really quickly, a little roadmap for how I'm going to talk about what we found. So I'm going to talk about what we observed in terms of instructional time, in terms of math content, in terms of the nature of instruction. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about how that compares to the curriculum that the teachers were using, how it compares to what uh, Common Core State Standards specify, and how it compares to what we know about prior research. Um, in future, we, I think we would like to compare this curriculum to other curricula that are, the Common Core curricula that are out there to see how much what we're finding in this matches with what uh, other curricular materials look like. And the other thing that I would really love to do, and I'm trying to get somebody to fund this, would be to replicate this study in a different uh, district. You know, this is very specific to New York City. It's a large urban district. I think that can tell us a lot. But um, 
you know, I, I get to the end of this and I wonder, you know, what does it look like elsewhere? Um, and so hopefully I'll find somebody to take on that. Okay, so what did we find? Um, first, we found that almost all of the instructional time in these classrooms was spent on reading and math. Um, teachers spent on average about um, 55 or 60 minutes on math and about an hour and a half on reading. Um, uh, they spent about 60 minutes on other subjects, which included social studies, art and music, science, uh, gross motor, social emotional, um, and really when you look at the breakdown of the other subjects, they're spending two to three percent of their time on each of those, so not a lot of other subjects. And then we also found that 150 plus minutes of every school day was spent on uh, no content. And so just so that you know, it's included in no content. So recess was coded as gross motor, so that was not included in it as no content, although very few of these schools actually had a lot of recess, recess time. Lunch or meals or snack time was usually coded as no content unless the teacher was like, the kids were having a snack and they were, um, you know, she was reading them a story. Um, lunch lasted about a half an hour. So really we saw about two hours that was, um, transitions, uh, waiting for things to get passed out, waiting for teachers to come for specials. Uh, there was a lot of waiting. I mean, in a kindergarten classroom, it does take a while for little people to get their coats off and to you know, get settled, and, um, but uh, we were surprised by, by how much downtime uh, and how much of the day was spent. Robin, do you, I think you cited some other papers. So this two and a half hours um, of not much content uh, is, is that, consistent. So it's not just in New York City. It's not just in New York City. And I will talk about that yeah. in, in a minute. Yeah, so, right. So this, um, the amount of time uh, spent on math is consistent with district policy, which says you should be spending uh, five 60-minute math blocks each week. Uh, it's actually not consistent. So the, the district policy also says that you should just be spending 60 minutes on literacy. But as you see, they, they spend more time on literacy than that, even though that actually isn't what's uh, uh, dictated by district policy. The district also does recommend having uh, two to three hours each week on social studies and science. Uh, and I have not done the breakdown of our exact time to see how far off they are. But I suspect they are not meeting those benchmarks in terms of science and social studies. Um, so this is consistent with prior research that uh, teachers tend to spend more time on reading than math. That's what Mimi and Amy saw in the XLSK, and it's been documented elsewhere as well. Um, and then there was a, there was research done in the early 1990s, um, one study that was done in Chicago looking at um, instructional time and found very similar findings to this, that lots of instructional time is lost to transitions and classroom management and other interruptions like fire drills and, uh, you know, announcements over the PA and, and things like that. So this is um, relatively consistent with what has been found in the past. And I assume you didn't go to any days where they were doing testing or stuff like that? We did not. We, but they do not like to have you in their school when they're doing <laughs> testing, so uh, we avoided the testing periods. We also did, um, we didn't go when they were going to be giving a math assessment either. Um, just, you know, like a unit assessment, we tried to avoid those days as well. Um, but we, did, we were not there. And you're right, the testing that also... That all of those numbers, in terms of the yeah. averages, are even further suppressed. Yeah, yes. Uh, Yes, if you count testing as no instruction, then then yes. And to the, you know, you can argue about test prep uh, and how much of it is like here's how you fill in the bubble and and how much of it is actually like reviewing uh, real content. But um, that's right. And we didn't, we weren't there. You know, this does not count days off of school or any of those things either. So. Um, in terms of content, we found that the content that was covered actually got more complex between the fall and the spring. So, um, so we've got uh, numeral recognition and simple counting, which is just counting forwards by ones, and complex counting, which is either skip counting or counting backwards or counting by tens and ones. So you could go 10, 20, 30, 31, 32, 33. And you can see that they were spending about a quarter of their time in the fall on numeral recognition and simple counting. By the spring, that had dropped to 15% of the time. And then uh, the fall, they were doing almost no complex counting, but they were up to almost 20% in, in, in the spring. 
comparing and ordering, which is, you know, knowing that seven comes before eight uh, in the sequence and that, you know, six is smaller than eight or ten is bigger than eight. Uh, spent a lot of time on that in the fall, a little bit less in the spring. And then, so, and then composing numbers. So composing numbers is um, uh, teaching children that uh, the number six is uh, zero and six and one and five and uh, two and four and three and three, and understanding the, that numbers are composed of other numbers. Um, it's a, a um, foundational skill for early addition and subtraction, so they were spending a lot of time on that in the fall. Uh, by the spring, you can see they were spending a ton of time on addition and subtraction. Uh, the content that was covered in the classrooms, and this is consistent also with the curriculum we'll talk about in a minute, uh, was limited to numbers and operations. So you didn't see anything on there about shapes, what I just showed you. There was nothing on there about shapes. Only 3 to 5% of the SMAs were focused on shapes and geometry. Only, you know, uh, depending whether it was the fall or spring, 1 to 6% of the SMAs were focused on patterning. And then there was no time. We saw no classifying, no graphing, no motion and spatial sense, no measuring, uh, no currency. Um, so it was all um, numbers and operations. So how does this compare with what has been found in the past? So. This is more complex than uh, the work that Mimi and Amy had done using the ECLSK. Uh, there appears to be a significant amount of time that gets spent on addition and subtraction in the spring, and even in the fall, they're doing a lot of uh, the composing numbers, which is really a foundational skill for early addition and subtraction. It's probably not something that most of these kids are coming into the classroom already knowing. Um, on the other hand, the range of content is somewhat narrower than what has been previously documented. So uh, in the ECLSK data, teachers reported spending quite a bit of time on shapes and on patterns and measurement and on place value and currency, and we saw almost none of that in these classrooms. So I think there are a number of reasons why that might be. So how does this align? So, yeah, so sure. That, so ECLSK was based on a teacher survey. Exactly. So like if you've done the same survey, with teachers, I mean, so your observations documented that you didn't see much of this, but if you've done a survey of teachers, did they say, oh, I spent a were their responses similar to the EF ECLSK so responses? We didn't administer that survey, so we don't know for sure. Um, but um, what I'm about to show is that the curriculum itself uh, does not spend any time on any of these things. Uh, and that is partly because Common Core State Standards uh, don't emphasize these things in kindergarten. Um, we did see teachers following the curriculum very closely, um, so I suspect that they were not spending a lot of time, but I don't know for sure. Um, okay, so what is um, Common Core? Uh, Common Core says that most of the time in kindergarten should be spent on counting and cardinality, so uh, operations and algebraic thinking, which is like the foundations for early addition and subtraction. Number on operations in base 10, uh, which is like place value stuff, uh, and then also measurement and data and geometry. But the Common Core state standards do say that most of the work in kindergarten should be focused on these first three things, which are basically what we saw in the classroom. Um, so we, like I said, we did observe, and I will show you in a moment, that teachers were really pretty closely following along with the curriculum. Uh, we could document what teachers said. I was on Chapter 5.3 of the curriculum. We could go back and look at the curriculum and see that they did basically what was in Chapter 5.3. Um, but the pacing uh, was slower than was intended by the curriculum. So when we went in the fall, a majority of the teachers were on Chapters 3 or 4 of the curriculum. The, this is when we visited in November and December. By the moment we went back in the spring, which was mostly March, teachers were on chapters five and six. So teachers were covering uh, approximately a chapter per month. Yeah, Heather? Uh, um, you can finish the slide, but I was going to ask why. Okay, okay. <laughs> so teachers are covering about a chapter per month, and so if you map that out, that by June, they probably were getting to chapters nine and ten. Uh, the curriculum itself had 12 chapters in total, and the last four chapters focused on measurement and shapes. Now, I'm sure that the curriculum developers knew that everyone was not going to get through all 12 chapters, and that's why they put measurement and shapes at the, at the end, because 
Common Core really says you're supposed to focus mostly on uh, on the numbers and operations, but um, uh, that is what we observed. Yeah. So, like, why? I can imagine many different scenarios leading to this. Do you have a sense from from observing, like, why the pacing? Yeah, or talking to teachers about what was going on. You know, I so we did not realize quite how off the pacing was when we were there, so we did not actually ask teachers. Uh, I don't have a great sense as to why the pacing was off, although I suspect some of it has to do with the assembly that gets called and they don't have math and the snow days and things that, that interrupt. And I suspect also, so when we did ask teachers um, about why they taught what they did, they sometimes told us, well, I went back to repeat this because the kids didn't understand it, and so I'm sure the curriculum thinks you're going to get through the chapter unit and one day and it takes two or three to get through it with the kids. Um, but it's a great question that I don't have a definitive answer to. But except the stuff in the fall, you said 95% of the kids show up knowing it. So 95% of kids uh, come in show of uh, knowing basic shapes and how to count to 10 basically and identify numbers one through 10. Uh, in the fall, they were doing other things besides that. They were doing comparing and ordering, right? Understanding whether six is less than eight. Um, uh, they were doing that composing number stuff in the fall, which kids probably hadn't had prior exposure to. So um, I think that, like I said, I think that the uh, content that is being covered is more complex than what was a, reported in the UCLSK. And sorry if you've already said this, yeah, but what was the year of them using this curriculum? This was 2015, 2015. Oh, yeah. I mean, how many years? Mm -hmm. that, yeah, that's a great question. So it was a, their second year using this curriculum. Yeah. So, so also they, yeah. And that right. happens where, yeah. like, they're getting to know it, so they're slower also yeah. sort of feeling to get out. Yeah, so we are actually back in classrooms again right yeah. now. Um, he's actually in a classroom right. today. Uh, so it'll be interesting mm -hmm. to see how things change as mm -hmm. teachers get more familiar with it. And so you looked at 15 classrooms. Um, how much? I, I'm curious about just getting a sense of the variability of, of the estimates you showed of the allocation of time in each category. So, was there like was there a lot of classroom to classroom variability in these numbers, or were the classrooms basically breaking down in the same proportions? Like you can imagine, yeah. you get roughly the same time yeah. if they were just yeah. following the block structure. Or, yeah, uh, it was pretty consistent across the classrooms. Um, so. They were, yeah, we saw about an hour and a half in most classrooms of literacy, about an hour of math, um, and then not very much of, of other content. Um, and there were some, so I think there was more, so there was less variability in terms of the literacy and math, and actually less variability in the no content, and more variability, like some days we were there and they were doing a lot of music, because they had a music special or something along those lines. but. Um, but pretty consistent uh, across the board in uh, the classrooms about math and reading time. And then within the subcategories of math, was there consistency there? Uh, yes and no. Um, like I said, it was very clear that teachers were following the curriculum. Depending on what day we were there, we might have seen something different, right? So, you know, if they were in chapter three, they were doing one thing. If they were in chapter four, they were doing something else. But uh, across the board, everyone seemed to be following the curriculum. Yeah. I'll defer to the end. They should go. I have a question. Um, like my entire uh, graduate studies here, I come across a lot the, the growing fear that uh, kindergarten is converting to becoming first grade. So I wonder what is your experience observing, um, you know, the teaching uh, and learning process, and and I guess it prompted the pace that you just talked about that prompted me to think about that question again. That w whether really developmentally the kids may be really. Are, are they really ready for this type of curriculum or not? So I would wonder what you, you would share about your own Yeah, process. so actually let me, if people don't have other questions about the pacing, let me keep going because I'm going to show a little bit about how instruction was delivered and I can talk a little bit about that academic. Okay. That word, I cannot say that word. Um, okay, this was really quickly to show you kind of, um, uh, that the content did mirror what was in the curriculum. It's not, it's not exactly aligned. Like this is um, uh, comparing what we saw to what was in chapters one to four of the curriculum, and it's not perfectly aligned. But you can see in general, like if the curriculum did a lot of uh, comparing and ordering, we did see a lot of that, um, and you know we saw very little of shapes and other things that were not in the curriculum. 
Um, so one thing I could say about the way instruction was delivered, it was delivered clearly. Uh, students and teachers were engaged. Uh, and by that, I mean the teacher was actively involved in almost all, you know, 80% of the instruction. The teacher was actively engaged. Uh, we rated students, like, on average 90% of the time, more than 75% of the kids were actively engaged in math during the math lessons. Um, teachers were not making a lot of mathematical errors, although, you know, they were there. Um, and classroom management uh, didn't hinder most of the activities, about 10% of the uh, specific math activities that we observed, there were serious classroom management issues that hindered instruction. So in general, like, uh, people were engaged in math and teaching math. Yeah. Um, how many SMAs did you observe, like, per observation? It really differed. Okay. Uh, it really differed. Although, I will say that I think on average we observed about three SMAs, uh, but that there was a lot of variability. Like some teachers had lots of different SMAs and other teachers had very few. But mostly, and you'll see this actually I think in the next slide. Um, so mostly the instruction was basically delivered in a whole group setting, and so the math block usually went like this. All the kids sat on the rug, the teachers stood up at the, at the board and discussed whatever the math concept was, and then all the, teacher, all the kids went back to their seats and they worked on their workbooks at their seats. Um, uh, and so usually there were two, maybe three SMAs there, the one where they were in the whole group and then one where they were in seat work. Um, I think I forgot to also mention, just randomly, that almost all the math instruction we saw was during the math block. About five minutes of that total that I showed was math that occurred outside of the math block, and usually that was during calendar time, so at the beginning of the morning they would count the days of the week, or um, sometimes they would do a quick patterning activity with the calendar. But that was really the only math that we saw besides the, the math block. Okay, so uh, to get kind of at your point, uh, a lot of whole group instruction and a lot of kids sitting at their seat and really an expectation that they sit quietly on the rug and then sit quietly in their seats and do their own books uh, with the teacher circulating. And you can see that only about 10% of the SMAs that we saw were involved small groups and that was almost always when the teacher would say, okay, why don't you guys pair up to work on, on the workbook together? So sometimes the kids would pair, um, but no small group instruction. Um, and, I mean, part of that is because there is only one teacher in those classrooms. So there are no other adults in, in those classrooms. Um, and so it would be very hard to actually facilitate any kind of small group. It's hard for a teacher to get around to four or five tables of children and really facilitate five-year-olds working independently in small groups. But um, the grouping is also very consistent with what is uh, in the curriculum. So. Uh, you know, 70 to 80 percent of the curriculum calls for whole group instruction, and uh, very little of the curriculum suggests that teachers uh, engage in small group work with the children. Um, we also found that most of the instructor did not include any materials, not any hands-on materials. Um, more than 50% of the instruction included no materials whatsoever. And I will clarify that what was coded as using materials was materials that the children were using. So the teacher might be using some materials to demonstrate at the, at the front of the classroom. Um, but this was materials that children were able to work with. Um, another 30% or so uh, of the SMAs included workbooks only, and then about 20% uh, children were working with manipulatives, and mostly um, counters uh, is what we saw. Again, uh, this is pretty consistent <clears throat> with what we saw in the curriculum, especially the use of manipulatives, right? So in the fall, uh, we saw that like 25% of the SMAs involved manipulatives and, you know, 23% of the uh, lessons that we coded in the curriculum itself also included manipulatives. Um, we did not see a lot of uh, open-ended questioning, reflection, or scaffolding in the classrooms that we were in. <clears throat> uh, only like less than 10% of the classroom SMAs that we observed had substantial open-ended questions and by open-ended questions I mean questions that are designed to elicit uh, student thought about how they solved a problem or how they um, uh, came to an answer justifying their their answers questions that involve more than one uh, answer. There was not a lot of mathematical reflection. By that, I mean summarizing what students are saying, relating it to other things in their lives or other things that they've learned. 
um, or just simply summarizing at the end of a lesson to say, you know, this is what we did today, you know, tomorrow we're going to do X, Y, and Z, and this is how those two things relate. Um, and not a lot of scaffolding. Go ahead. Uh, go ahead. Oh, what are the intermediate categories here? Um, so uh, these, yeah, great question. So these were, it was a uh, one to five scale. One was none. Two was uh, like one or two open-ended questions throughout the SMA. Um, and five was like throughout the lesson, uh, the teacher asked open-ended questions. So, all right. And Thanks. so substantial is five. Okay. Um, you know what? A substantial may even be four and five. And little to none is one or two. I, I'm almost be it. So how much of this was in the curriculum? That's the next slide. Uh, did you have a, a no, question? No, no. Yeah. Um, so we see the same thing in the, the curriculum. Like there were, so the curriculum is pretty scripted, and it tells the teachers, like, these are the questions you're supposed to ask, and this is how you're supposed to lead the discussion. And, and so when we went and coded the curriculum, we coded for open-ended questions or, like, discuss with the children, and we found very little of it. Um, uh, so it's very consistent. You know, teachers are following what is what is in, in the curriculum. Uh, what what curriculum is it? It's Go Map. Uh, and uh, yeah, you're not supposed to say. That. I don't know if I'm supposed to say it or not. We didn't put it in the paper. Now you want to know. So <laughs> now I know. Don't call the, the, the publisher. I'm not ready to get nasty emails and, uh, at this point. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay, so let's see. In terms of what this means in terms of Common Core standards. Um, so Common Core says that math instruction, new, the new math instruction is supposed to have three components. It's supposed to have focus, which means there's supposed to be a greater focus on fewer topics, not a mile wide and an inch deep, but like, you know, go deep into the concepts so that children learn them really well. It's supposed to have coherence, by which they really mean linking that the curriculum itself should be coherent and things should, you know, uh, one thing should build on another and first grade should build on kindergarten, et cetera. Um, and then it's supposed to have an equal rigor, which they say is like an equal focus on deep conceptual <coughs> understanding, procedural skills, and fluency. Um, which includes like a deep authentic command of mathematical concepts and uh, being able to assess access concepts from a variety of different perspectives and um, uh, and apply them. So I feel like you know what we saw there was definitely greater focus, right? We uh, they were focusing on uh, uh, counting and numeracy, like that was what they were doing for for the whole year, and it does appear to be more focused than what we saw previously in the ECLSK. I would say that the, the curriculum itself, when you look at the whole curriculum, the curriculum is coherent. It does build on um, itself. And there are clear indications in the curriculum itself about this is what's going to happen in first grade, and this is how this might prepare uh, students. But there's not a lot in the curriculum itself to prompt teachers to make those links for students. And we didn't see those links being made um, by the teachers. Um, we did not see a lot of, uh, you know, deep conceptual understanding kinds of work going on in these classrooms, uh, and I think that is not inconsistent with a lot of what gets observed in, in math instruction. And again, uh, we didn't see a lot of that in the curriculum either. It was it was pretty um, teacher directed, um, uh, and uh, focused on on more on procedural skills and fluency. I would say than deep conceptual understanding. Yep. So uh, this is probably a stupid question, but how do you know when a kindergartner has a deep, authentic command of mathematical concepts? It's a great question. It's not a stupid question at all. Um, so I don't know, you know, I think there are ways to assess children to understand whether they can approach the same problem in many different ways. And that's what you would like, right? So, you know, there's all the research out there that shows that, like, Kindergartner like, children can do two plus three equals when it's you know written horizontally, and then they see it vertically, and they have no idea what to do because they've just okay. So there's that. Um, but in trying to train people how to use this observation instrument, we watched a lot of video of teachers, um, and there was a great one where, and this is not how you know if the teachers, uh, the kids are doing it, but how you might uh, elicit this kind of deep conceptual understanding. She was using a ten frame, uh, and um, she had one 10 frame that had like, do you guys know what a 10 frame no. is? Okay, so a 10 frame is like a, a five by two grid. Um, okay. And it's used to help uh, kids understand um, 
composition of number. Uh, and so, you know, when you fill up the grid, you can sort of see that like five plus one is six, right? Because you've like fill up. Okay. So she was using two 10 frames and she had one that had like six dots in it and one that had um, four dots in it. And she asked the kids, well, how many, how many dots are there all together? And, you know, the kids raised their hands and they gave their answers and some kids got it right and some kids got it wrong. She wrote all of the answers on the board. And then she said, you know, how many of you think this is the right answer? How many of you think this is the right answer? And then she asked each kid to explain how they got their answer. Like, why do you think it, why, you said it was nine. Why do you think it's nine? And the kids would explain. And it was amazing, like, the different ways that the kids had solved this problem. Um, and, you know, and, and she, it helped the kids who got, got it wrong to really work through, like, well, why did I get this wrong? You know, that now I see that the answer should be 10. I think that was a problem I just gave you. Um, I see that the answer should be 10, and, and, um, uh, and they were able to explain how they got there. So I think that's the kind of thing, like, that's what people are talking about when they're talking about the deep conceptual understanding. That was a long answer to that question. So, and I have no idea what time it is, but I did want to leave time for discussion. So, conclusions from this at this point. Um, despite the potential importance of early uh, math, uh, kindergarten teachers do continue to spend more time on literacy, at least in New York City, than they do on math. It does appear that maybe content coverage has shifted in response to Common Core standards. I don't think we can say that definitively, but um, we're certainly seeing uh, you know, a narrower range than was documented in the ECLSK. Um, it does not look uh, like instructional delivery has changed months in response. Uh, again, we can't say it definitively. But the big takeaway that I am taking at this point is that how much the curriculum influences not only what is taught, but how it is taught. And it makes me feel like there is real potential there. And I think this is not new, but there's real potential to influence uh, what's going on in the classroom uh, by simply changing the curricular materials in ways that uh, give teachers additional supports and guidance about uh, how to deliver instruction. So that was, that's what I have. And I'm happy to take questions or chat about uh, other things related to early. Um, did your data collection at all look at the extent to which students like demonstrated the competencies that the teachers were focusing on? No. Um, because it would be interesting to figure out, for example, whether the slow movement through the curriculum reflects uh, waiting until everyone has mastered a given standard or skill in a way that a more personalized approach might solve in theory. Uh, and so how much of it was driven by uh, I don't know, the needs of the group versus individual students? Um, I think it is a great question. I'm trying to think about the easiest way to get at it and whether we have any information at all to, to shed light on it. Um, Do you have assessments with the kids? <laughs> so we have assessments for some of the kids. The problem is what we have are Okay, so in New York City, they don't assess kids uh, in any kind of consistent way in, in math, so we can't get those that assessment data. And you'd really need it in an ongoing way, like <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You'd really need like the unit assessment yeah. data, which we did ask, and they do not collect in any kind of a systematic way. Or like um, you would need um, so some of those developmental assessments that kids take throughout the year to kind of see where it's going. We do have some assessment data on them, but they are for the kids that were part of the study. Um, so they're all kids who had the building blocks pre-K, and so it's not going to be a representative sample of all the kids in those classrooms. Um, do you have any information about whether teachers were using like you know pre and post tests or some sort of assessment of mastery? They were they were doing these unit tests. Uh, so the curriculum itself has a little unit test, and they were giving those at the end of um, each unit to see see how kids were doing. So your colleague Brian Rowan has somewhere in the vault log data from kindergarten teachers from 2004, 2005, that actually almost exactly mimics your instrument. So it's not observational data, but it would be able to, you'd be able to actually get at some of the questions about pacing that Marty asked by looking at how many days math was not taught in kindergarten, mm -hmm. looking at the repetition of content over yeah. specific days. And so it might make an interesting addition, of like addendum to the paper or another comparison point. Or maybe you could just stick one of the memes on it. Um, 
So the, you know, because it is fascinating how this has kind of changed but not changed over the last uh, 15 years, but also the sort of persistence of this kind of like, we just go really slow through kindergarten. Mm -hmm. Counting. Mm -hmm. yeah, correct. I just had a question in some of the interviews with teachers, if you've had any sense, were there other things that influence instructional delivery? Because I think in some of the work we've done in upper elementary school, there's a sense that it's important to kind of get the principal on board because the principal observes. And if there's kind of an inconsistent way you approach instruction, and the principal could kind of influence that piece of it. So are there like lead math teachers? Are there principals observing kindergarten? Is there a, any kind of press from like the, the STEM office at, at the DOE around how math is taught? Or is it really just the curriculum? And what you're seeing is the curriculum is just being adhered to, and it's just not ideal. So we did not hear teachers say, oh, I'm really trying to do, my principal feels really strongly about that kind of stuff, which I do think you hear. Um, and and we did not hear a lot of stress about where they were in the curriculum. Like sometimes you'll hear like, I have to stick with the pacing guide and like the pacing guide says that, and we did not hear that either. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that this just made me think of is that, that as we also did some interviews with administrators uh, at the end, not actually about this study, but for the, for the larger study. Um, and we asked them, just by happenstance, like how has uh, instruction changed in math? And the principals went on and on about how great it is now. They get so much more conceptual. Kids are really using manipulatives. They're really talking to each other about the math. And I just found that fascinating because I do not feel like that's what we observed at all. I mean, also, again, yeah, not new, a new finding, but yeah. But can you go back to this question? Because this is also, you touched on this uh, piece that I find fascinating because I've gotten in many arguments with people who think that there's too much math in kindergarten and it's too hard for the kids. And so how do you reconcile that sort of policy discourse with what you were seeing in the schools? So I kind of feel like it's not the content that is the problem, but it is the delivery of that content. You know, so they, in the building blocks in the pre-K, right, math is taught and they're doing like lots of active things where they're, you know, manipulating things and learning as they go and they're able to get up and move around and, and, and do things. And in these classrooms, the children were really sitting. So in that sense, I feel like it is very, much looks like first grade, like they're expected to sit quietly on the floor and answer the questions with a quiet raised hand, sit quietly in their seats and work through the workbooks. Um, I mean, I think the research suggests that like the content probably isn't too hard, that kids do benefit from this content and that this content is developmentally appropriate for, for this age, but maybe not exactly the, in the way that it is being delivered. Hi. Are there any comparable studies that look at suburban, rich, etc. kindergartens? Yeah. Like, See, this is, is this exactly the, the study that I want to do because I'm not so sure. Like, we we can all sit and say, "Oh, this seems really awful," or whatever we want to say about it. But I'm not so sure that it actually looks that much different in different contexts. And um, so that is, I really would love to do that. I really tried to get Heising Simons to fund that. I said, what we really should do is go like to Westchester and do the same thing and then have a point of comparison what they wanted to do another year in New York City. How about the ECLSK kinds of stuff? <coughs> That yeah, I mean, so you don't get a lot about what the nature of instruction is, but um, the urban districts, in terms of content, don't look different, very different from the suburb, suburban districts. Um, do you find that there's consistency across content areas in terms of like the amount of sit and get kind of like whole class lecture versus hands on and like individualized instruction? Like, did you code that up for the English blocks and the other blocks as well? Um, we did, uh, we do, yes, we do know that, and it is pretty consistent. Like, the whole day is basically spent sitting, so it's not as though in literacy. It's not just that in math, it's like they yeah. can't handle so much lecture. It's, right, it's, exactly. Yeah, it's across the board. I was wondering the discrepancy you were describing between pre-K, the pre-K curriculum and the kindergarten curriculum, did, does class size have anything to do with that? Like, my understanding is in pre-K you have, like, maybe a teacher with nine kids yeah. and you can Absolutely. hang out in a group, but when you have 30, you can't in a kindergarten class. Yeah. So, okay, so two things. One, the average class size in these uh, kindergarten classrooms is 20, which I was super surprised about. I really thought that we were going to see much larger class class sizes. So it wasn't as though these were super huge classes. At the same time, I think I mentioned briefly at the beginning that uh, the teacher was usually the only adult in the classroom. And so without other adults, I mean, in pre-K classrooms, you usually have a much smaller 
teacher-student ratio. Um, and I do think it makes it hard. Um, and there are, I mean, there are lots of children in these schools that have behavioral challenges that they're dealing with, and the teacher's trying to manage all that while delivering instruction. So without adult adults, it does make it challenging. Yep. So I was an early elementary teacher in New York City, and so I have kind of a different perspective on this. Um, my impression is that the reason why so many schools use Go Math is because it's funded by the DOE because it is Common Core aligned. Mm -hmm. And so in my school, we tried to pull from different curricula that were a little bit more developmentally based, that were used more manipulatives, but the city didn't pay for that. And so we didn't have that, and we also didn't have like the time and um, opportunities to work together to design our own curriculum. Um, so are you using this research to put pressure on like the city to see, you know, if they can better fund better curricula? Uh, I, you know, we haven't gotten that far in it, but I, I think even more broadly, so I think we are uh, in a few weeks going to go um, brief the DOE on these findings and talk to them, um, and I think uh, we will have conversations about that. But I think even more broadly, you know, curriculum are designated as Common Core aligned because the curriculum publisher says this is Common Core aligned, and it does feel like if, if we want to ensure that these Common Core aligned curricula are really encouraging what Common Core says, that there should be somebody else who is determining whether it gets the stamp of Common Core aligned or not. Um, but. So in terms of the importance of the more time in literacy than math, how much of that is driven by a bell schedule, you know, what you're looking at versus like there was literacy outside of them that was your average? Uh, there was, so there was no, I think I'm going to answer your question. There was no bell schedule. Okay. So the teacher just decided, all right, we're going to do math now and then we're going to take a break and then we're going to do literacy. And, and um, the one difference between the literacy and the math, the math really was all at one point in time. The literacy did happen throughout the day, so there was, you know, there was a time when the teacher was reading to the students, and then there was another time where they were, um, you know, working on spelling, and so there was, it was more spread out throughout the day. This kind of study is, is helpful in that in, by learning a bit more about what's going on in the classrooms, you can form hypotheses about different ideas about trying to change things. And it would, it's hard to um, imagine trying to do that without this kind of study as an early thing. I actually found two things very encouraging about it that, that you found, and I, you commented on, on one, and that is the potential role of curriculum materials Absolutely. and you know the nice thing about that is that's really that's cheap because a bad curriculum costs as much as a good curriculum and um, even if you're just adding some manipulatives that's cheap relative to shrinking class size or anything like that but the second one that I'd love to hear you think more about is is okay so that two and a half hours of Unmute or not very well used time during the day. You know, a lot of people fret about increasing the school day or, you know, trying to do the charter school thing. Well, <coughs> gosh, like, could we make better use of the hours, you know, that we've got? And what would be some ideas for trying to, to do that rather than, like, have that be a teacher by teacher thing? Is there, a, are there any? You know, ideas for trying to yeah. work on that on a broader scale than classroom by classroom. Yeah, I'm so I'm thinking about a couple of, of different things, and I'm not sure that they're actually the right way to go. I mean, you certainly could be you could be more directive with teachers about exactly how to spend their time, um, and then you would probably see you know more science and more social studies if you you know were checking up on teachers to make sure they were doing it. That doesn't seem necessarily like the right way to go. I mean, a lot of it, too, had to do with classroom management kinds of issues. And just like, so it's not an inexpensive solution, but having more adults in those classrooms uh, would have helped a lot in a lot of that downtime uh, in trying to shepherd you know, kids from one activity to another. If the teacher, I mean, I just think about it like, 
some of the videos we watched, there was always a teacher's aide, and the teacher's aide would like pass out all the worksheets on, on the table, and then the kids would transition, the worksheets were right there. In our classrooms that we were observing, there was just the one teacher, and so unless she got there really early and passed out all the worksheets ahead of time, she was passing out the worksheets, or the kids were passing them out as they sat down. Um, and I think, I, I also think that that is the one place where you would see a big um, urban suburban difference you know and at least my kids classrooms there's always parents who are coming into the kindergarten classroom to help with like the small group stuff um, so I think that's not um, an expensive response but that might be one one way I'll have to think about what else but one could do this isn't yeah. really my day to talk but I'll just say one thing it's also reciprocal with teaching quality which is to say the strong teacher also uses the time so it, so the mandating how to use the time doesn't really get at the issue of, you know, hyper-focusing on a negative behavior. And then a vicious cycle ensues where I never actually engage in the cognitively rigorous task, which would mitigate the behavior. So there's this cycle, you know, and this is partly seen in Steph's work to yeah. Steph Jones. It's just these cycles of getting hyper-focused on behavior at the expense of the cognitively rigorous engagement or task which then diminishes engagement. So it's, you know, some of it is that. Which is where this curriculum piece comes in, because if the literacy were socially, social studies and science based, right. and took more time in the day, and same with math, right, you might get a little more traction there. I would also say that um, part of what we saw, like some of the teachers in their classrooms did a great job of managing their time and managing the classrooms, but then the kids went to specials and the teachers very much needed that time to plan and to have a little downtime. And the specials were often, you know, very hard to manage and they sometimes had um, multiple classes in the specials at the same time. Um, and so one teacher trying to now manage like 60 kids and so forth. That's in New York City specifically. Yeah. I think the specials. Yeah, it might be. Yeah. Yeah. Has anybody done like a causal study of the curriculum thing? Like so, sort of do this pre-post a change in the curriculum. You know, this is interesting. It's forming a hypothesis that given the uniformity of teaching practice that seemed to adhere to the curriculum, a curriculum looks like a powerful tool. But like... Like how does it change? Yeah, right? yeah. so like you change the curriculum, yeah. you see a change. It, it, like you introduce a curriculum that has more of the things that you want, like open-ended, you know, questions right. and so forth. Do you see a lot right. more open-ended questions? Yeah, I don't know that. I don't know of any. That doesn't mean they're not out there, but I think it would be really interesting study to do. Some sort of important. Yeah. There's lots of RCTs and okay. elementary math, uh, uh, preschool and elementary math curricula that are running around. So that's one place to look. Yeah. So. Great. So there have been evaluations of elementary math curriculum, but have they been connected to, did instruction change? You yeah, know, I mean, usually, like, did, did I mean, that's true, out, right? Like, there's also, IES funding yeah. pretty much carries a requirement that you do a sort of check on instructional quality at this point. So we just did a, a sort of review of IES funded studies, and almost all of them take a look at preschool or kindergarten. Instructional quality usually uses in class as the primary instrument that's used at this point. So, and then some people like Kitty Gonzalez, who's not here today, are doing um, some you know nice mediation analyses to sort of get a causal estimate off of uh, the instrument of professional development of instructional quality on student outcomes. And so it's a, it's kind of an interesting field, and I've seen that in other places as well in the pre-K curriculum. Yeah. Thank you. So thanks uh, very much.